Hello, this is part four of Minidog, the open source quadrupedal robot. It's mostly 3D printed and made with servos and off-the-shelf parts. And I've geared those servos down and we also have compliance in the joints with springs and magnets and hall effect sensors that can sense the load on each joint to make it more dynamic. So check out the last few videos on that, including part one, which was my test leg. So in this video, we're gonna do the kinematic model, which involves integrating the remote control so we get three axes of translation and three axes of rotation. And we need to do that before we can make it walk so that we can translate the feet in Cartesian coordinates in X, Y, Z space and work those joints back to the complex angles we've got for the three motors in the joints so that we can move those legs in any axis we want in straight lines, which means as it walks, we can get those legs to move perfectly backwards and that's going to make it much easier to make it balance. The remote control I'm using is the good old Open Dog Stroke Sonic the Hedgehog remote which is why it says Sonic remote on it and it's an Arduino Mega with an NRF24 LO1 transceiver chip in it for the radio. We've got various switches and buttons and two three axis joysticks which move in these axis and they also rotate and that means we can do three axis of translation and three axis of rotation. Before we go and install the radio chip in the dog and get the data from the remote on there, this is just a quick ad for ways you can support the channel, and that really makes all the difference to the projects. I have Patreon and YouTube channel membership, and if you sign up for those, you can get access to all the videos up to a week early, and also sneak peeks and pictures of what's coming up and be part of that discussion. I have a merchandise store and the links in the description to this video, where you can get t-shirts, bags, socks, and various other things with pictures of things I've made over the years on them. There's also some affiliate links in the description for various services, and if you sign up for those, some of them are actually free trials. It won't cost you any more, but I'll get some money, and that really helps support the channel. Right, let's do some soldering. So a bit of creative wiring on my Perma Proto board here. Here's my NRF24 LO1 that plugs in there and that breaks out the pins here to this piece of pin strip. So that fits on top of my box where it was before. We've got one connector here for the I2C for the inertial measurement unit and we just need another wire now that takes SPI in there to our teensy to connect up the remote device. So I've wired those connectors in, I've put clear heat shrink on these pieces of solder terminals. Um, if you're wondering there, the other one is white heat shrink and all that wire's wired in for all the SPI. So now we should be able to get that remote data. So I've put the electronics back in the box. We've got a power supply smoothing capacitor and a decoupling capacitor because I found sometimes those NRF chips have problems with power supply issues. So make sure the power supply is nice and sorted. We can see we've got the IMU data still working there. And we've also now got all of our controls working, including some switches that I can switch on and off that should be giving us some digital bits on the end there. So that seems to be working all right. Now I've thresholded the sticks, so there is a bit of play in these sticks. So I've thresholded them so they do start at zero and count all the way up. But there's a dead spot of 50 either way on the analog in of that Arduino Mega. So we do get to zero in the middle and we don't get lots of noise on the controls. I've also got a safety feature that means if the remote becomes disconnected, then everything goes to zero. So if I hold one of these sticks and pull out the power, we should see we get zero and a message saying there's no remote data, which means we can put the robot into a safety mode. And as soon as that comes back up, then we should be good again. So let's have a look at that in a serial plotter. So we should see everything's at zero pretty much. That's all of our sticks. And we've got that IMU data as well for the pitch and for the roll. So that seems to be working pretty well and we're ready to put that back into the dog. So I've now tied up my remote so that we can control the modes of the robot. So we should find that we've got no compliance here, just the springs. And if I turn on one of the switches here, we should now find that compliance is back on using those Hall effect sensors to go and read the positions, how much that spring is getting stretched essentially and how far the magnets are from the Hall effect sensor. And we're using that to go and actively drive the joints to give it compliance. So that works fine. The rest of what we did last time is getting scrapped though and we'll make it walk again with the kinematic model. So the first part of the kinematic model is going to be solving this leg length from the hip to the ankle and trying to move this ankle up and down in a perfectly straight line. So you'll notice the foot is directly below the shoulder joint at the moment. What we need to do is modify both the shoulder and the knee joint as we give it data or give it a length for this distance here. So we can use trigonometry to work that out. And that means we should be able to move the robot up and down 
in a perfectly straight line without its feet sliding sideways, and that's the first axis of our kinematic model. So on paper that looks like a triangle which I've drawn in red here, and we're going to give the input is going to be this length here which we're going to call Z, and that is the height of the robot from the ground. Now you'll notice the triangle doesn't quite converge at the actual point where the foot is touching the ground, depending on the angle of the shin here that's going to be a different place, so I've just assumed that it's in the middle for now, there'll be some error. Now cunningly this distance here, and this distance here are both 125 millimeters, they're both the same, and that was part of the design because I knew I had to solve this model. And that means all the angles in the triangle, not only will they add up to 180 degrees as they do with any triangle, but it means that this angle and this angle will be the same. So as long as we can solve one of the angles in the triangle, then we can easily work out the others because two of them are the same, and we can do 180 degrees minus the other two, and that gives us the one we haven't solved. So all we need to do is basically do some trigonometry to solve one angle, and we know all three lengths of the triangle. So this is pretty much high school mathematics, but I'm using the website mathsisfun.com to try and solve this, because I can't remember how to do it, even though I did it for OpenDog. So this is the page for solving SSS triangles, which means we know all three sides, and we want to work out the angles. And all the maths is here, and all we need, of course, is to solve one angle, so we're going to use this first example here, which involves a bit of Pythagoras theorem by the look of it, and finally some trigonometry. And here it is in code, so I've essentially gone through each stage, and I've got a different variable for each stage, so I can check it. Eventually we do an inverse cosine, which gives us the angle. Now this angle is in radians, which is what programming languages typically use, so eventually we'll have to do a conversion into degrees. So if we convert degrees to radians with this Google page, we'll find one radian is roughly 57 and a bit degrees, two is 114, and all these numbers look a bit weird until we get to a very familiar looking number of pi, 3.1415927, and that's 180 degrees. So you'll remember me saying that we could get 180 and take away the two other angles to find the other one, but of course it's not 180 degrees, it's 180 in radians, which is pi, so we're doing pi minus the other angle times two, which are the two angles the same, and that then gives us both angles for the knee and the shoulder. So I've then converted those to degrees so I can actually look at them, and I've put those out to the serial terminal. We're not going to look at that, we're going to look at the real robot. So then for each leg, I've taken off the offset, so the knee is already at 90 degrees and the shoulder's already at 45, and then I've multiplied that by a scaling factor, and that is to get the microseconds value to actually drive the servo to the right angle. On this leg, which is the front left, we're doing that in a positive manner, and on the other leg, which is the front right, the leg is the other way round, so we've actually inverted the scaler so the joints move the same way. And then at the back it's the same, and inverted again for the other back leg. So I've now mapped the twist of the right hand stick to that leg length input. So now as I turn that stick, we should find those legs getting longer and shorter. And it's calculating the trigonometry about 100 times a second every time that loop goes round. So it should always remain with the foot perfectly under the shoulder. Now we do have a situation where the knee servo has to move further than the hip servo, and both of these servos have motion filters on at the moment. I'm actually filtering the servos individually rather than the actual Z demand, and that means depending on how fast I move this, obviously we exceed the maximum speed of the motor, and one motor can get there faster than the other one, so that means it doesn't necessarily move in a straight line, and to do that we need to interpolate through every position on the way, and drive it slower than the maximum speed of the motor. But actually, having checked this with a ruler and a protractor, it looks like my angles are correct, and it looks like my leg moves to the right length. And of course, my robot is compliant anyway, so any minor errors get taken out in the natural flex in that compliancy. But of course, the result is that the robot does go up and down, and that's the first axis of our kinematic model. So now that's done, the next axis we're going to do is moving the robot in a perfectly straight line in this direction. So that means we want to move the foot backwards and forwards along this line while keeping the shoulder at exactly the same height. So that means as the foot moves over here, of course that height has to get longer. So now we're going to feed the bit of mass we just did that calculates the leg length with this value and take this value from the stick, so as we turn it, the robot still goes up and down, and that gives us the actual shoulder height. But this is an easy bit of trigonometry, because it's a right angle triangle. We know this piece, which is the input. We know this piece, which is how far we want to move the foot. So all we need to do is calculate the hypotenuse, 
and the angle here. So we can solve this with tangent and then sine or cosine. So you can check it on Maths is Fun if you want to, but here's the code. So we're doing a tan or an inverse a tan of the new x over the new z. And that works out how much we need to add to the shoulder joint in radians and we convert that into degrees. And the next stage is just doing z over the cos of the shoulder angle. And that works out the actual leg length we now need and we can feed that into the code below. So I've added those angles together down here. Some of them we add um, a positive amount and some of them we add a negative amount or at least we turn that around to the negative of the value. We take it away and that's because the leg is the other way around. So now we should find if I move the stick backwards and forwards, it should move backwards and forwards in a perfectly straight line until we exceed the servo end position. And of course, because we're feeding one piece of code with the other piece for those other values, the Z stick still works as well, although it's quite hard to hold this stick still in rotation and move it perfectly forwards and backwards. But all of those axes work together. And now it's time to do the third translation axis, which is of course sideways in this direction. So on paper again, I've drawn triangles on the diagram. This one is slightly different because we've still got the Z height here and we've got the foot offset here, but we've got this offset because the pivot point is here, but the leg center is over here. So we need to work out two triangles, which both are the same size to start with, with the Z height from the stick. The Y is now how far we want to move the foot, but we start with an offset, but then, when the leg moves, of course, this length gets much bigger and this triangle gets tipped up slightly. So first of all, we need to work out the hypotenuse and this angle. And then once we've got this hypotenuse from this right angle triangle, we can then work out this right angle triangle to work out what the new length is here. And of course, this foot should get longer to touch the ground here. So the first thing I've done here is to actually turn the axis round if the leg is on the other side. So this whole thing is actually a function that takes the leg number and the x, y, and z coordinates. So basically, because the leg is built the other way around, we can't just turn the answer around, we've got to turn around the input for the legs on the other side of the robot. First of all, I calculate the first triangle shown on the paper, and then the second one, and I've taken away the rest position, because there's always an angle there because of that offset, before I turn it into degrees. Having got that angle at the hip, I've then gone and calculated the new length of the second triangle, and we can use those to feed into the rest of the code. So that new z value goes into the second bit of code we did, and from there it goes into the first bit of code. So, of course, the result of that now is that we can move the robot sideways in either direction, and you'll notice that we can see quite clearly that this leg is getting longer than this leg as it does so, so that the body stays perfectly flat. And as a result of having fed those variables all the way through the code, all the way through, it means all of those axes mix nicely together, so I can move it forwards and move it sideways if I want to, or move it up and down, and generally move it all around. So those are our three axes of translation. The next one's a rotation, which is going to be roll, pitch, and turning it this way for your. So what we're gonna to do to make that work and keep the original three translation axis working is actually write the rotation axis in terms of the translation axis. So we're gonna work out what happens to the feet when we do these motions, and then actually just plug those numbers into the translation code that we've already written. So for both pitch and roll, we've got the dog's body here and its legs here, whichever way we look at it, whether this is a side view or the front view, and of course we're going to rotate the body either way. So that means one leg needs to get longer and one needs to get shorter, whichever way round it is. So the side axis is simple enough to do the pitch calculation, and the best way to think about this is if we actually keep the robot level and alter the ground, so we tip the grounds, making one leg longer and one shorter. As a result of doing that though, the body does get shorter this way. Because it tilts, the distance gets smaller, and that brings the legs in, so those tilt in slightly as a trapezoid. But we can easily calculate what that distance is, because we can calculate the difference here, based on the angle, and we can calculate how much shorter this gets, as well as how much higher it gets in the z-axis. So our z-axis input is going to be here, which is the total height of the robot. Our x in is the offset here from where the foot is from the stick. Then we need to work out this little triangle to work out the difference because of the trapezoid. And finally, this angle, which gives us a new z and a new x in terms of the x and z axis that we've already worked out. So basically assuming the robot's flat and the foot has then moved over here in Cartesian coordinates. 
And the Y axis from the end, the roll axis is very similar. It looks more confusing because again, we've got this offset, but really took care of that in the translation code. So we can just assume that the leg is in fact a straight line, which goes like this, a virtual leg, if you will. And then we do the same thing. And this triangle is just a bit more stretched because this is wider. Then we work out exactly the same two axis, but this time it's Z and Y. And we go and give that to the existing code for translation as well. But of course, as we make one end of the robot higher and one end of the robot lower, those new Z values will actually impact the robot in the roll axis. So we need to do this one first and then take the Z for each end of the robot, the height, the actual shoulder height, and feed that into the Z for the roll axis because one end of the robot will be higher and one will be lower. And so that will impact all the triangles when we calculate the roll. So I'm not gonna go through every line of the code. The code will be published though. And if you know what you're solving, I think I've written it out fairly clearly in clear stages with good variable names. And that's all the code basically for the pitch and the roll as well. Now there's several opportunities in here where things have got switched over and then they've got switched over again. And that's just basically so the triangles work themselves around the correct way for each side or each end of the robot. And then the offsets have been removed so that we get those things centered around zero and things the right way around to hand on to the next stage of the code. The variables that come out of the bottom of this pitch hands the roll and then roll gets handed off to the next stage to the translation axis. So that appears to work fine. We've got our pitch axis that works quite well and we've also got our roll axis and it should be pivoting the robot perfectly in the middle. So for the roll axis, that pivot points perfectly in between these two nuts and that should stay stationary, give or take. And of course those axes mix with everything else. So I can go forward a bit and I can roll or I can go and pitch or I can move sideways and the same thing works or I can make it much shorter or taller. And again, those axes still work. And I've also done the bonus your axis. So I'm not gonna tell you how I did this one, but I am publishing the code so you can play along at home and look at that. It's actually one of the easiest ones to do, but one of the most satisfying moves. And of course the axis mixes with all the others. So we can do our roll or we can do our your and all of those axes work together to give us quite a fluid motion. And you'll notice in some of those yaw moves, it appears that one of the feet actually slips on the ground. And the reason for that is that the servos reach their end position, so they can't actually get to where the mass is telling them to go. So the mass is right and the robot is wrong as usual. And that's one of the limitations of gearing down servos like that, because we only really get 90 degrees out of the leg. And of course they've got hard end stops. But that's enough for this episode. Next time we're gonna deal with interpolation, which is actually moving through all the waypoints from A to B for any of the feet. And that means that we can actually move in a perfectly straight line. At the moment, of course, I'm moving the sticks and I'm manually interpolating by moving them for all the positions on the way. But we need to do that so we can actually make motions and make it walk. After that, we'll be making it walk, hopefully, using the inertial measurement unit and treating the robot like it's a balancing robot on two wheels. So basically varying the speed that it walks based on how much it tips in an attempt to keep it stable. I'm not sure if the servos are quick enough to do those sorts of motions to actually meet the demand from the pitch controller that will keep it stable. So if that fails, we'll do a statically stable gate just taking one leg off the ground at a time, which is actually how a real dog walks when it's going slowly. So that's the end of this video. Don't forget to like and subscribe if you like the project. I am publishing all the cat and code as open source. So if you'd like to help support the channel, then you can fund me through Patreon or YouTube channel membership. And those links are in the description to this video. All right, that's all for now.